The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Good morning, OB Evangelical, on this little bit chilly sanctuary morning. Uh, but we are many this morning, so we'll warm up the place in due course. What a great uh, reminder that the Lord is our strength and song this morning as we enter into his uh, worship this morning or the worship of him this morning. He has become our salvation. And that is reason enough, is it not to lift up our hearts, lift up our eyes to him, lift up our voices as well and honor our creator. Let's pray to our creator this morning. Creator God, uh, you are the one who hold the oceans in your hands, number every grain of sand, kings and nations tremble at your voice, and all creation rises to rejoice as the hymn says that we're about to sing. Pray that our hearts would be full this morning, that we would join with creation, that it wouldn't be rocks that take our place this morning, but our own voices, the first fruit of our lips would be your praise. And we praise your name. Amen. Well, good morning again. My name is Gary Prickett. I'm the minister here at OB Evangelical. I think that's the first time I've said, or not said, the new minister. Uh, as I... So apologies uh, indeed for the heating. That's a mea culpa with an emphasis on me. Uh, I had turned the heating off rather than to auto on Friday. So uh, you can blame me for the temperature this morning. Sorry about that, uh, but um, by about the benediction, it should be perfect. <laughs> so please do stay for coffee following. Um, tonight, we are continuing our series on how God sees the church. Two words that are thought about, I think, concepts are thought about so deeply in our society today, unity and diversity. Uh, these are hopes and desires for our society. Well, we are going to see tonight how God sees that, the outworking of his own unity and diversity through the church. And so come and join us at 6.30 if you are able. We'll turn to our Old Testament reading. You can turn with me to Isaiah chapter 52. Uh, following that, I invite the uh, children to, be, uh, to move out to the creche and to take part in that this morning. We thank you for our crash workers this morning as well. Uh, I will pray uh, over the children and then our pastoral prayer as well. So from Isaiah 52, verse 13. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So that so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. <clears throat> Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. May the Lord bless the reading of his word this morning. We've been reading a little bit from the Old Testament on many Sundays, just because our readings are so short from 1 Peter and 1 Peter as I've mentioned before, loves going back and looking at those shadows that are cast from the Old Testament to give us understanding uh, in uh, his letter as well. Let's pray over our children as we invite them to attend our crush. <clears throat> Lord, we do thank you. We thank you for our children. They are indeed a blessing. 
We love hearing even their sounds. It's sounds of, of life and activity. Um, we pray the parents would not be overly self-conscious about such things, for we, we long to see more and more children to fill our house here. This morning, as, as they uh, hear your word and as they are loved, would they see a love beyond the love of carers? Would they see your love, a love that is shed abroad through those carers' hearts by your Holy Spirit? We pray they would, from a young age, uh, grow to, to know you and to love you, to know not only of their need of salvation, but the provision of salvation through Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we turn to God's word, let's pray. Father, who are we that you have set your love upon us? And yet we know with great confidence that indeed you have. This morning, as we come to your word, we desire to come humbly. We come recognizing our need of it. As Peter once said, Lord, to whom would we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. May your words be life and health to us this morning. Help me as your messenger to be clear. Uh, help every ear to uh, receive this word mixed with the faith that you've granted. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 So turn again to 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, this week, this is our third Sunday in our sort of series within a series looking at salvation in particular. And so I want to read the entirety of this section, verses 3 to 12, even though uh, we will focus on verses 10 to 12 this morning. So 1 Peter 1, uh, 3 through 12, this is God's word. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you've not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Well, I wonder this morning, uh, have you ever experienced something so wonderful that you wanted to tell those you know and love all about it? I'm sure you all have perhaps a new restaurant that served that perfect Italian meal. Um, last week, I recommended to one of the members of our congregation, uh, knowing that he loves hamburgers, uh, the place that I have found the best hamburger in Leicester. And coming from a North American, that's no small commendation. Well, he thanked me for that and kindly gave me his own recommendation, which I've not had the opportunity to uh, exercise that recommendation yet, but looking forward to it. Or perhaps you've seen a movie that kept you captivated from front to back all the way through. When we do share those things that we um, just love and, and want to share the joy of, perhaps you do so tempering it a little bit, 
because we have that sense that if we oversell something, it's going to be underwhelming for a friend or a loved one, right? Well, Peter in today's text, I think has the wonder of salvation on his mind. He's experienced it. He revels in it. He wants his readers and listeners to comprehend salvation's glory. He's already acknowledged their difficult circumstances. Remember, all the way back to verse 1, he identified them as exiles, did he not? But particularly, they're elect exiles, elect exiles. And so what Peter has done in verses 3 to 12 is to put on display what it means to be chosen of God, how that will fuel their hope and their confidence, and their joy. That is what he does, doesn't he, from verses 3 to 12, as we've seen in the last uh, couple of weeks. And in today's text, verses 10 to 12, I think he pulls out all the stops. The attention for these verses is upon the grace of salvation. And my structure is very simple this morning. I believe Peter wants us to treasure that grace of salvation to receive the grace of salvation, and in so doing, worship the Christ of our great salvation. So firstly, treasuring the grace of salvation. Peter writes, you can see in verse 10, concerning this salvation. This salvation, of course, that he has been referring to from verses 3 through 9 already. It refers directly back to verse 9, certainly the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. But of course, Peter's had this in mind since rejoicing in verse 3. He points out the future living hope and a salvation guarded by God in verse 5. He tells us how to rejoice in this hope and through even the trials of life until we have a purified faith yielding a glorious salvation. Now concerning this salvation, he presents it as something of great interest and worth. He's looked forward, then he grounded them in the present, and now he looks back to the Old Testament prophets. Look with me at verses 10 and 11. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the suffering uh, subsequent glories. I think we have three ways specifically that we can treasure as Peter presents it. So this is a, a sneaky way of making a five point sermon out of a three point sermon. I'll grant that, but uh, three ways that we're going to treasure the grace of salvation. And firstly, we see the Spirit of Christ predicted the sufferings of Christ. The Spirit of Christ predicted the sufferings of Christ. Now, we know prophets of God spoke for God, and they spoke of God. That was what a prophet did in the Old Testament, not from their own fanciful imaginations. Peter, for instance, in his second letter, wrote of the process. He said, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's uh, 2 Peter 1, 21. And here I think we see such an example, the Spirit of Christ in them predicting the sufferings of Christ. And these are really beautiful phrases that Peter gives us. Carried along by the Spirit, or the Spirit in them. Thought of a a part of Greek mythology, Aeolus was the wind god who lived on an island. He had six daughters and six sons. Homer writes of him in the Odyssey. And this wind god summoned breezes that helped uh, Odysseus along the way. And from this myth, we get a musical instrument named the uh, Aeolian harp. Now, as I understand it, it's not played by touch, but rather the wind blows through its taut strings 
that are strung in a, a very particular way over the soundboard. And I think this is something like how uh, we can describe the work of these prophets. The Spirit of God, as it were, inspiring them, moving them, carrying them along the way as they wrote and preached to reveal for our sake the plan of salvation. So I want us to think about that statement that Peter makes, that the eternal Christ, centuries before his suffering and death, was inspiring the prophets by the Spirit to anticipate his own sufferings and glories. It's quite a remarkable thing, isn't it? In fact, as far back as salvation was a concern, any concern for God, the eternal Christ knew of his sacrificial death. Beloved, we were not merely loved for one dramatic moment on the cross. We were thought of. We were cherished as Christ's inheritance. We were loved from eternity past. For the joy set before him, the writer of Hebrews said, he endured the cross. And one of those myriad joys was you this morning. One of those joys was me. Imagine that. And so we treasure because the spirit of Christ predicted the sufferings of Christ. Secondly, we see from this text that the prophets searched for it. Peter says the prophets searched and inquired carefully. So yes, these prophets were certainly inspired by the Holy Spirit to write what they wrote, to preach what they preached to a people, but that does not reduce them to some kind of automatic, uh, distant robotic writer. They were captivated by what the Holy Spirit revealed to them, revealed to them about the Messiah, about his work, about his coming kingdom. No, for these prophets, their work, and it probably would be better to say their worship rather than their work, it didn't stop with the revelation of the writing. It also included uh, the investigation of what they wrote about, of what was revealed to them, their minds and their hearts. So think about that Old Testament text, for instance, that I read from earlier, Isaiah 52 and 53. I'll just summarize it. And have in mind, what is Isaiah thinking as he's scribing this for the first time? Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. Yet he had no form or majesty that should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. What do you think Isaiah was thinking and feeling? Why was his heart so full that he would diligently search and inquire? Keep in mind that from the earliest of our humans, Adam and Eve, after they sinned, what was promised to them was a serpent crusher. And then as we work through salvation history in the Old Testament, we see a, a, a refining, as it were, of the promises that get more and more specific. And these dear prophets who were having these revelations come to them know they're human and they know of their need of peace. They know of their need for a national savior. And, and they have the privilege, as it were, of having some of that curtain peeled back and they share it for us and for our sake. How about Psalm 118, 22? The psalmist wrote that the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, or Hosea 2, 23. And I will have mercy on no mercy, and I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say in response, you are my God. Well, Peter is encouraged by those prophetic words. He picks up on that and encourages himself and his readers when he writes, 
Once you were not a people, now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. Is this not what Paul said of the words of Scripture, of the Old Testament? For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. No, these prophets, because their heart was full, they didn't merely write, they searched and inquired. They, they wanted to go beyond, they wanted to understand beyond even what they had written, though they struggled to do so. Who was this Messiah? When would he come? Why was he a suffering servant? Why would the one who could shut the king's mouth suffer? Even in spite of his obedience and rule and authority. How would they search and inquire? Well, it wasn't certainly to go down to the local public library. There were no internet cafes. They just did those simple means of grace that are still available to us. It was through prayer. It was through inquiring of the scriptures they had. They didn't even have the whole of the Old Testament, right? They inquired of what they had. And then, of course, through prayer and scripture reading, they'd reflect with and unto the Lord. And so I want to ask, could we not treasure that which so captivated the prophets' hearts and minds? And then thirdly, of course, we treasure the grace of our salvation quite simply but profoundly because Christ paid for it. Christ paid for it. Jesus, of course, centers all of history. All of history is centered around Christ. And of course, the cross was his central mission. Mission. Alexander McLaren wrote this, I think, and I just want to quote him because it's written so beautifully. It's not enough to preach Christ. We must preach Christ crucified. We must preach Christ crucified. It's not enough to preach the ethical teachings of Jesus, although we must seek to live by them. It's not enough to point to Jesus as our great example, although his life should be our model. It's not even enough to speak of his death as a brave sacrifice, unless we make it clear that he died for our sins according to the scriptures. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and he accomplished this salvation through his death on the cross. So how do we treasure this grace of salvation? Why do we? Well, one, because Christ paid for it. We remember that Christ paid for it. And what he paid for was our sin. What a wonder. What a privilege we have on this side of the cross. And so we treasure the grace of our salvation. Secondly, though, we are called to receive the grace of our salvation. Did you notice in verse 10, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours? And in verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. In the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven into things which the angels long to look this grace was to be yours, Peter said. And those long ago prophets served not themselves, but you. That means us as well. And again, I want you to use your imaginations to think, what would those first hearers of Peter's letter have felt and thought as they heard that for the first time? These are just common folk. In fact, common beleaguered folk. They're exiles. What would it have meant to them to hear that people like Abraham and Moses and Joshua and David and Ezekiel and Isaiah and Zechariah and Hosea, Micah, etc., those were serving not themselves, but me. I think that's absolutely astounding. Well, how did they serve us? Well, through the law and the prophets, 
the Old Testament scriptures, as we call it, we understand the need of salvation. We understand the promise of salvation. And we understand the messianic means of salvation. So they have served us amazingly, wonderfully well. Everything, of course, pointing to the cross. And these things, Peter says, are now announced to them. And they're announced to us by those who preach the good news by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. You know, if you're a Christian this morning, at some point, somebody did that for you. They delivered to you. They preached to you. They shared with you. They testified of the good news of Jesus Christ. And I would say if you're not a Christian this morning, whether you're here this morning or watching online, that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing this morning. I'm laying before you the treasures of this great salvation and inviting you to receive it. But receive it, you must. Receive it, you must. In Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, he urged them to not receive the grace of God in vain. To not receive the grace of God in vain. That's a little bit of a tricky expression, and certainly there's been some debate on what it means. But vain in general means to be empty, to be void of purpose. And so to receive the grace of God in vain can certainly mean rejecting it. It comes to us, but we turn away, we reject it. And so perhaps you've had entreaties sent your way. You've heard, you've sat under the preaching of the gospel, or a friend has shared uh, the basics of the Christian faith, and rather than embracing, you've turned away. Well, that's a grace that has been extended to you that has been extended unfortunately, in vain. I would also, though, add, I think, and most would agree, that Christians can also receive the grace of God vainly, in that we don't receive that which the Lord would have us receive as part of the graces of his salvation. Things like the growth that we can uh, experience of discipleship, uh, the peace that passes understanding, growing in the bearing of the fruit of the Spirit. All of these things are the part of that package of grace that comes with our salvation. And so we as Christians can receive God's grace in vain as well. Again, how are we served? Well, earlier we sang that great older hymn, I cannot tell why. I cannot tell why he whom angels worship should set his love upon the sons of men, but he has, and he does. Continues, I cannot tell how silently he suffered, as with his peace he graced this place of tears, but he did. But this I know, the song says, he heals the brokenhearted. He stays our sin and calms our lurking fear. He lifts the burden from the heavy laden. For still the Savior, Savior of the world, is here. Indeed, what a wonder our salvation is. Ten times in his short letter, Peter refers to the grace of God. God's salvation is great because his grace is great. I think it was Corey Ten Boom that said, no pit is so deep that the grace of God is not deeper still. And so I urge you this morning, if you're not a Christian, to receive the grace of salvation. And if you are, receive the fullness of the grace of your salvation. And then thirdly, I think Peter has in mind that we would worship Christ for the grace of our salvation. This is the third week of us considering Peter's little exposition within his letter on salvation from verses 3 to 12. He speaks of its glorious future in verses 3 to 5, of its sustaining present in verses 6 to 9. And in today's text, he places these future and present glories in the context of past prophetic promises within the word of God. Promises now realized and promises we are called to proclaim. So I think the overwhelming sense I have is the wonder 
of the grace of salvation. The wonder for one of the unity of God's word. You know, the unity of God's word is a remarkable thing. We have Old and New Testaments, but they're unified in focus. At the center of it all stands the cross. And everything in the Old Testament points toward it. Everything in the New Testament revels in it. And we have the privilege now to be not outsiders, but we're on the inside looking at the cross receiving the work of the cross, reveling as Peter does in the cross. But I also think <clears throat> beyond that, that as I said before, Jesus centers history, BC, AD, right? Regardless of what academics try to do, if you're aware of that, they now removed before Christ and Anno Domini, it's I think uh, CE, common era, and uh, before the common era. So when I asked someone, well, when did the common era start? <laughs> yeah, you get the point. Um, but we see here how old and new testaments work in harmony. I also see, though, the wonder of faithful proclamation. The wonder of faithful proclamation. So many people look for novel or, you know, new ways of enticing people to come to what they present as the Christian faith. And here we're reminded by Peter that what the Holy Spirit inspires is the simple proclamation of the good news of Christ and Christ crucified. Now, Peter starts this section in verse three by rejoicing. He says, does he not? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not surprising because he who comprehends his salvation, this grace of salvation, what else can he do but praise God for it? Look what the Lord has done. He can do no less. And I think this exhortation is trying to promote that same kind of exaltation, a doxology, as it were, amongst his readers. He wants them to consider the wonders of this wondrous salvation. And it doesn't end with Peter. Can you see the host that he brings around to draw attention to the wonders of salvation? He enlists the prophets of old. He enlists the Holy Spirit. He enlists faithful preachers of the good news, and even the angels to encourage us to see that not only do we have a great salvation, but we have a privileged position. What prophets and angels could only strain to try to see, they long to see it. They could search and inquire. They could meditate upon and pray. Well, we have before us the fulfillment of the hopes and fears of all those years. You know, prophets labored their whole lives and throughout their whole ministry to present the gospel to us and present the gospel they did. I think of uh, Philip, for instance, catching up to that chariot and he finds the Ethiopian eunuch reading from Isaiah and he doesn't understand it. And what does he do? He explains the gospel. <coughs> such that that Ethiopian eunuch gets saved out of the gospel, as it were, of Isaiah, immediately baptized as well. And so they've labored to present the gospel to us, to point the world toward the cross, to anticipate the Messiah. And of course, preachers go into all the world to ensure this gospel of grace is heard. And angels long to gaze upon what the Lord has done for us. Perhaps most importantly, the Spirit of Christ is constantly drawing God's people to God's grace of salvation. Through these three short verses, Peter, in a sense, says, can you see, can you see how much God cares for you? Can you see how much God loves you? You've been on his heart and mind for eternity past. For centuries, the fullness of the grace of your salvation has been the joy and privilege of these servants of God. 
They've had you in mind. They've had you in mind. And so this is something we're called to treasure, to receive. And in so doing, worship Christ. And then, of course, let it rub off on somebody. Let this worship rub off on somebody else. You know, the grace of salvation is something that can never be oversold like a movie or even the best Italian restaurant, because no eye has seen, no ear has heard the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, this morning, I, I pray that these words would encourage us as they must have encouraged these beleaguered exiles and yet exiles who were elect. <clears throat> what a wonder is the majestic history of salvation. Even in the moment of that very first sin, you were not caught off guard. You had a plan. And this history of salvation is a history that continues to be written with us today. We thank you, yes, for past faithful prophets, and we thank you for present faithful preachers. But may this serve to encourage us in the treasuring of this salvation, so great a salvation. And in so doing, may we worship you all the more fully. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and deed. Go in his peace this morning, church. You are loved. Amen.